Robin Farman Farmian is our speaker of this morning. And I had stuff that was what Joe said I was supposed to be doing about uh, a, an introduction. But I had a chance to talk with her this morning and uh, to get a sense. She'll tell you about the stuff that she does. And she's enormously uh, active in the San Francisco area as uh, a booster of an enthusiast, a futurist. Uh, but what I learned this morning is uh, about Robin as a patient, uh, as a, 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 a steely, confident patient uh, who's taking charge of her own health in a way that utilizes the technologies that uh, we've been talking and learning about at this conference uh, to care for herself. And let's hear how uh, she can inspire us uh, for all of us to take care of ourselves. Robin. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out so early in the morning. So as you said, I am Robin Farman Farmian. Tell you a little bit about my background. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've worked on seven startup companies in med tech, very cutting edge med tech. The reason I decided to get into med tech is because as a teenager, I was misdiagnosed with an autoimmune disease ended up resulting in 43 hospitalizations and six major surgeries. Now, when you're facing surgery, and especially when you're a kid, right, you go from hospital system to hospital system, looking for the very best doctors out there. So everyone from, say, Dartmouth-Hitchcock to Harvard's Mass General and Boston Children's, pretty much every hospital in between. None of my doctors actually looked at me and said, you know what, Robin? Technology is hope. But technology is hope. In fact, had they known what was coming down the pipeline in medicine, they most likely would not have done surgery on me as a teenager, and I would probably not have lost three organs. So that's why I came on board as one of the founders of Exponential Medicine. Exponential Medicine is a conference for physicians talking about the next two, five, and 10 years in exponential technology and medicine, and how that's really intersecting and disrupting it. So what's it like to be a patient today and in the near future? Well, we've got lots of portable point of care diagnostic devices now. So take something like the AliveCore EKG machine. It's a portable iPhone case, retails for about $200 with a prescription, FDA approved. You can take your EKG now, send the data up to the cloud where it can be read by your doctor anywhere in the world. And with the advent of telepresent medicine, you can now have a doctor's appointment via FaceTime or Skype from anywhere. In fact, the Veterans Administration has had 690,000 telepresent medicine visits in the fiscal year 2014. That's about 12% of all covered veterans. And what about potentially getting your medication delivered by drone? There's a company called Matternet using artificial intelligence-enabled drones to deliver medication or vaccine about two kilos worth to remote locations. They're prototyping in East Africa, where the nearest doctor could be a two or three day walk away over roads that might not even be passable over nine months out of the year. Talk about getting game-changing technology into the, into the hands that need it to the most. In fact, we are experiencing a convergence in medicine, a rapid acceleration of technological discovery really enabling the era of the patient. So I'll talk about genomics right now. It costs maybe a couple thousand dollars, but back in 2001, sequencing the genome was $2.7 billion. That is actually, the price is dropping so quickly, it's exceeding Moore's law. By the end of the decade, it's most likely going to be the penny genome, and we will be able to sequence the world. Talk about the resulting amount of big data. We're going to have to completely reinvent a word for big data. After, you have to add in the software component at that point. Artificial intelligence. IBM Watson is really leading the way in AI applied to medicine. In fact, they've opened up their API so that anyone from an entrepreneur to a Fortune 500 company now has access to using Watson. All right, so we have to add in the hardware component, things like 3D printing. So to me, 3D printing is the most disruptive technology out there across all industries and economies. But it gets especially exciting when you talk about it regarding healthcare. In fact, right now, you can do something like 3D print scoliosis back braces. The reason scoliosis patients are not compliant is for the most part, the back braces are so uncomfortable. But with 3D printing, complexity is free. What does that mean? It means I can 3D print 
a back brace for me. And it costs exactly the same as 3D printing a back brace that would, in fact, fit someone like Joe. Exactly. What's also really exciting is the FDA has recently approved 3D printed facial implants for facial reconstruction. And these implants actually support bone attachments. But what's even more exciting is 3D printing of organs. My friend Donna Cryer has a similar disease to mine, same set of surgeries, but with an incredibly rare side effect. Ended up actually losing her liver. Ended up needing a liver transplant. Now, while 3D printing of organs is probably on the 15 to 20 year mark because we have not been able to master the vascular system, my biggest wish for Donna is that at some point she gets her own liver back. But what's being done today Organovo is really one of the pioneers and leaders in 3D printing of tissues. They've been able to do liver, liver sections to test drug toxicity. So while that is a generic liver section at the moment, in a few years, I'm going to be able to 3D print a version of my liver to test a drug on it before I take it. An infrastructure. So just like with banking and education, infrastructure and content are separating. You are no longer constrained to a physical venue just to receive healthcare. In fact, and this is where this slide is actually relevant, anywhere you have access to a smartphone, you're going to have access to healthcare. It's expected over the next seven years, three billion additional people will be going online. So when we're talking about the future of medicine, we're not talking about the future of just one single thing, right? We're talking about the future of many things working in conjunction with each other the patient, the doctor, the tools, the science, integrated care. In a longer talk, I usually actually do a deep dive into all of these sections. Today, I'm going to touch on the patient and the doctor. So the future of the patient. We are now in an era of patient-driven healthcare. And my AV is still not working. <laughs> there we go. Can you advance? There we go. So how does technology enable the healthcare consumer? Well, Imagine being prescribed an app instead of a medication. Or what about the unprecedented access to information? Right now, most of us use Dr. Google on a weekly basis at least. But Google is prototyping Hangouts with physicians. So now when you actually Google some kind of a disease state, it'll pop up and say, would you like to talk to a physician right now? And you can pay to do that. Google is prototyping that, so watch that space. Things like micro blood draws. So Theranos launched in Walgreens about a year ago doing micro blood draws using one one thousandth of the amount of blood needed for a standard, typical blood draw. CLIA certified. You go into Walgreens, they pick the end of your finger, drop a blood, and you're done. You've got your CBC, your platelet, your differential, your liver function test. But what's really exciting is Theranos has patents to enter the device market with portable diagnostic systems. They have a patent on a silicone microneedle the size of a human hair. This way, you can now monitor your blood 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no longer needing to go to a lab or a hospital and exposing yourself to all that infectious disease. And patient-driven research platforms. My friend Sean Ahrens has Crohn's disease, and he decided to become one of the disruptors himself. Founded a company called Chronology, peer-to-peer -peer social networking site for patients with inflammatory bowel disease, IBD. Now, what started out as a social networking site has morphed into a patient-driven research platform because Sean was finding he was coming up with insights not found in the literature and that GI doctors didn't know about. Specifically, the majority of patients with IBD cannot tolerate beer. You're not going to find that in the literature, though. He found it out by using the power of the crowd and sensors. So all of you have heard of the phrase, the Internet of Things, coined back in 2009. Well, I'm thinking about an Internet of You. In fact, by 2019, the wearable device and sensor market is expected to be a $50 billion market. Massive opportunity in that space. And we're starting to see wearables get reimbursed. Not your Fitbit and your jawbone up, unfortunately. <laughs> that would be fun, right? But the VA is actually reimbursing wearable technology for things like Modus's stepwatch. Measures a number of highly specific clinical metrics relevant to the efficacy of prosthetics and orthotics. 
and point of care diagnostics, or what I like to call diagnostics on demand. We talked about the AliveCore EKG machine that uses your iPhone case, but we're starting to see a lot of compression shirts hit the market. Bazafit, startup company up in San Francisco, OM Signal, they recently partnered with Polo and they're making it mainstream. Intel even came out with its own smart shirt. But these are meant for athletes, really, not the clinical use. There's a company out of Israel, a startup company, called uh, Smartware. They're doing a 15 lead EKG shirt just for clinical use. And Waymu is doing a smart shirt for epilepsy diagnostics and monitoring. What's another cool thing in this space is GE partnered with the University of Washington last year to do a paper-based microfluidic exam to test for infectious diseases. You use a nose swab and you get results in under an hour. And your activity monitor on your computer, you know what I'm talking about, right? Does basic troubleshooting, diagnostics, tells you about your computer usage? Well, I'm thinking about a biometric activity monitor. What would that look like? Well, a beautiful UI. And all of us out here now, we don't you know, grab a cup of coffee the first thing in the morning, we all grab our smartphones. So I'm gonna grab my smartphone in the morning, and it's gonna come up with my biometric activity monitor, and it's gonna say, Robin, you're dehydrated today. You know what, maybe I'll grab an extra couple glasses of water. It's gonna tell me that my blood pressure is off and my, my medication needs tweaking. So it's going to automatically notify my doctor so that they can change my medication dosage. And it's gonna aggregate all of my family's health. And it'll start also aggregating all of my wearable tech devices. Now, the quantified self movement, it was the grassroots movement about 2008, 2009, and, and I've been in it since 2008 and 2009, except I'm not wearing a QS device today. Why? Well, my Fitbit battery died. <laughs> Again, I mean, you know what that's like. And I put it down somewhere in my house, again. And I lost it for the third time this year. And I have one of those jawbone ups, but just like with like the Galaxy Gear smartwatch or any of the bracelet ones, my wrists are tiny and delicate. And when I try to wear those, it actually hurts. And if it you know, potentially goes with this outfit, it's not gonna go with the majority of my outfits, which is a huge consideration when you are talking about patient engagement and compliance. Because if a patient doesn't like the way something looks, they're not gonna do it. But technology makes things seamless. The way I see this going is epidermal electronics. There's a company called MC10. Temporary tattoos, slap it on, stays on for two weeks at a time, Bluetooth enabled, does all your basic biometric activity monitoring. And there are some concept companies out there too, expected to hit the market in about five years. Tattoos that are subcutaneous. Put it in the palm of your hand under the skin. Not only does biometric activity data monitoring, but it'll be able to open up smart locks and even tell you who you saw that day. All of this technology is really raising the bar on the interaction between the patient and the physician. So if you think back to the title of my talk, the patient as the CEO of the healthcare team, and just like the CEO of a corporation where you surround yourself with a fantastic array of vice presidents, board, support staff, advisors, they do their jobs, synthesize the information and report back to you. Together, you determine a direction for the company to go into. But as CEO, you're the one who is ultimately responsible that that vision is carried out, and the company overall is successful. Why should being a patient be any different? All right, so with the future of the patient changing, what does the future of the doctor look like from the patient's point of view? We are in an information explosion, the rapid acceleration of technological discovery. How are physicians supposed to keep up with the sheer amount of clinical and research data coming at them? In 1970, there were 10 specialties. Today, over 170. How do they actually know what the entire ecosystem of healthcare looks like? So I propose doctors are gonna to need to become medical engineers, data literate, genome literate, device enabled, technically adept, and most importantly, collaborative with the patient. Some of the tools that are really helping doctors in this realm, I talked about IBM Watson at the beginning of the talk. The reason physicians like Watson is because not only will it give you the top three probabilities, It'll give you the evidence trail behind it, which is even more important. CrowdMed is a, a startup company up in San Francisco, about a year or a little year and a half old, using the power of the crowd to do basic diagnostics. It turns out their crowd are really retired healthcare professionals. 
And XPRIZE is helping spurring on in innovation in this particular sector with things like the Tricorder Incentivized Prize. It's a $10 million prize purse to come up with a device that will diagnose 15 diseases and measure five vital signs in the field without the presence of a doctor. And doctors will now be able to serve a global patient pool. But the biggest change is going to be around the mindset between the patient and the physician. Because if the patient is now the CEO of the healthcare team, that causes a massive shift in the power dynamic. How are physicians going to react? Well, it could cause a lot more mutual respect, definitely a lot more engagement on the patient's side. Because if the patient feels like they're on the team deciding their own care, they're going to be more engaged, more compliant, and we're definitely going to improve outcomes. But there could be some pitfalls, too, because patients could come in thinking they know more than they do or worse, misdiagnose at home and never see a doctor. About 10 years ago, mid-20s, I was, a, I was about 10 years into my, uh, don't do the math, <laughs> I was about 10 years into my misdiagnosis. I woke up one day and I was like, all of my doctors are wrong. They're wrong. They said I was cured because I'd had all that surgery and they had me on high-dose opiates and low-dose steroids. And anyone who knows those kinds of drugs knows that's not a way to live, right? I couldn't function. And they said that I would be on those medications for the rest of my life. So I woke up and I said, they're wrong. And I fired every single one of them. And I decided to become the CEO of my own healthcare team. I found an entirely new set of doctors that were collaborative with me, gave me my test results, allowed me to be on this decision-making process of my care, and allowed me to be in control. Very quickly, I was diagnosed correctly and put on Remicade. For the uh, physicians in the room, it's a small uh, anti-tumor necros anti necrosis factor, small molecule biologic. Changed my life overnight. I went from somebody who couldn't function on high-dose opiates to someone who didn't need painkillers at all and went out and started, helped start seven companies. So just like I did over a decade ago when I stopped allowing medicine to disrupt my life and I became the disruptor, Imagine a world where more patients are doing that. People don't want to go to a doctor's office, get a prescription, and sit in a waiting room, right? They just want to feel better. Let's think of all the different possible ways to get them there. To me, the future of the patient is the future of medicine. Thank you.